Hello again, everybody. This is Gary Mrozinski, and it's time now for Chapter 8 of The Microeconomy Today by authors Schiller and Gebhardt, published by McGraw-Hill. Remember, uh, we are going to now embark on a series of chapters where in each chapter we're looking at a different market structure where there's a different level of competition. At two ends of the spectrum, we have monopoly. That's where there's one seller, no competition. And the other end of the spectrum is where we're beginning the competitive firm. We're going to be thinking about markets where there are hundreds of sellers, even thousands of sellers, which is called peer competition. The competitive firm, that's what we're going to address here. And we're going to begin with a discussion of profit. Remember that we're assuming in this course that the objective of any business firm is to maximize profit. How much profit you get to enjoy as a business firm depends on the level of competition. As you can imagine, the less competition there is, the more profitable the sellers will be. The more competition there is, the less profitable the sellers will be because the market price will be lower. We'll be looking at all of that in the next few chapters. In this chapter, though, where we're looking at the competitive firm or pure competition, we're looking at how firms make price and production decisions. We'll do that in each of these next few chapters. We're looking at specifically what level of output, what value for Q will allow the business firm to maximize profit. That's what we're trying to zero in on. That's our goal with each of these uh, next few chapters. We'll talk about profit, as I said, we're going to begin with a discussion of profit and costs and economic profit versus accounting profit. That's where we're beginning. So profit is the difference between total revenue and total cost. Profit equals total revenue minus total cost. It's profit or the desire to maximize profit or the profit incentive that makes sellers want to sell more and makes producers want to produce more. And we'll talk just briefly about some other motivations other than profit that sometimes happen. We're assuming that uh, the profit incentive is always there in our analysis from this point on. But just very quickly, yes, I guess there are some cases where a worker could be uh, working in a 40-hour-a-week job making $50,000, but they feel alienated, they don't feel engaged in their work, and then they can strike out on their own and start their own small business where they're actually making less, working 40 hours a week and only making 45000 but they have a sense of identity and control. And I guess So that's not the profit incentive that would drive a person to do that. And how about if you're working in a very large corporation? Are you necessarily driven by profit? Uh, please, excuse me. Sorry about that. In a large corporation... Uh, sometimes the profit motive lies beneath the surface. Stockholders who are very interested in profit rarely visit the actual business firm, even the corporate headquarters, or even think of a national chain of some sort. Uh, managers have little or no stock in the company and therefore are motivated by salaries, job preservation, more so than profits for the owners because they're sort of further removed from the ownership of the company. And I think we can all uh, sort of relate to that. But we're going to assume that profit is a motive and is the primary objective of the business firms that we're discussing in this course. Is the profit motive bad? Is the profit incentive a bad thing? Well, if it drives the firm to produce inferior products at higher prices to skimp on quality in order to lower costs, it would be a bad thing. If it leads to pollution, so you're blindly doing what is best for your profit and ignoring uh, the pollution that you're generating, that of course is bad. Uh, if you're allowing your workers to work in an unsafe workplace because you don't want to increase your cost because profit is so important to you, that is a bad thing. So yes, blindly following profit and making these kinds of decisions would be bad. But overall, Adam Smith, Invisible Hand Theory, you know, more competition there is, then the more, uh, the lower the price will be, the better that will be for the consumer, the better it is for society. And 
it is business firms pursuit of maximizing profit that drives them to innovate and you need for that to happen in your economy without the profit incentive then you're not going to achieve what's called productive efficiency we're going to talk about that and allocative efficiency efficiency will be lower without the profit motive so again here is the profit equation profit equals total revenue minus total cost and we're going to break down the total cost part of this equation a little bit further to an economist economic costs include explicit costs plus also implicit costs an accountant might only consider explicit costs explicit costs or accounting costs are costs that can be tracked in dollars so these are costs for which a payment has been made and an accountant would be recording those transactions. These, those are accounting costs or explicit costs. Those are very easy to see. Implicit costs are not as easy to see. Remember we talked a good deal about opportunity costs. Opportunity costs are implicit costs. Remember my simple example of uh, a person who is graduating with a bachelor's degree in accounting and considering whether to stay in school for one more year to earn an MBA. The MBA, if they stay in school, will cost $15,000, a special tuition rate that their, their alma mater is offering to recent graduates. So then the explicit cost of that MBA is $15,000. That's the accounting cost. But there are implicit costs too. It's going to take you a year to earn that MBA, and we're assuming that you're not going to be able to work. Well, what would you have done... If you didn't pursue that MBA, you would have gone right into the workforce and made $60,000. So there's an additional implicit cost, an opportunity cost of $60,000, foregone wages. You're giving up the opportunity to work for a year because you're going to stay in school for one more year and earn an MBA. So the economic costs of the MBA are $15,000 plus $60,000 or $75,000. So that's what you base your decision on the total economic cost. So then profits are different too, right? We have economic profit and we have accounting profit. Accounting profit, so we're looking at the box down below here on the second, sec, second line. Accounting profit is total revenue minus just explicit costs. Economic profit is going to be a smaller amount, right? Economic profit is total revenue minus explicit costs, plus also minus implicit costs. So that will be a smaller amount of money. This is another way to look at it. In each case, that vertical bar, uh, bar graph you're looking at represents total revenue. This is the way it would divide up. Look at the right first. Uh, if you're only thinking about accounting profit, then you have accounting costs, explicit costs, the rest of the total revenue represents accounting profit. However, if you're thinking like an economist on the left, the explicit costs, the accounting costs are the same amount. So the purple on the right is the same as the green on the left. But now the remainder is divided into implicit costs and economic profit. So you have to also consider implicit costs and subtract that from total revenue before you get to economic profit. So economic profit will always be a smaller amount as long as there are implicit costs in the scenario. Now normal profit is an important concept that's going to come up from time to time for the rest of the course. Normal profit is the compensation that the entrepreneur would expect to earn for having chosen to take on the risks to start a business and use your own entrepreneurial skill in this situation and possibly your own capital. You expect to earn what's called a normal profit. And it's hard to monetize exactly what that is, but in the examples we're going to give, we're going to actually have, we're going to estimate what that normal profit is and use that in the problem. All right. So again, normal profit is the compensation you would expect to earn as the entrepreneur for having taken the risk to start this business, which might fail, and apply your entrepreneurial skill to the situation to create a successful business. That is what normal profit is. And economists will track this as a cost, an implicit cost. 
So here's an example. A drugstore owner, owner, you start your own drugstore, you could have instead opened a different kind of business, such as a fast food franchise, a music store, a steel plant. You would expect to earn some normal profit, some normal rate of return on your entrepreneurial skill taking the risk to open a business like that. That's what normal profit is. The reason you chose to open a drugstore instead is because you expect to earn above normal profits. So again, normal profit to an economist is going to represent a cost, an implicit cost, an opportunity cost. And here's more on normal profit. You could have invested your resources elsewhere. You could have applied your entrepreneurial skill to some other kind of a business. And if the opportunity cost is a return of 10%, then you would expect a normal profit of about 10%. That's what normal profit would be, 10% of whatever the investment was. So that's an expectation as an entrepreneur uh, in taking on the risk. Uh, and so that's going to be what we consider to be normal profit. So you choose the business you choose as an entrepreneur only because you expect to earn above normal profit. So for that reason, economic cost is going to include normal profit as a cost, an implicit cost. All right, so let's look at an example. Suppose you're going to start a business and you need $100,000 in startup funding. And you have two options. You can borrow the money, get a small business loan from a bank, the bank will charge you 5% interest rate. So then that 5% interest expense that you take on is an explicit cost, right? The $100,000 is not a cost because you're going to use that to say buy a facility. Let's put it that way. Suppose you actually buy a facility for $100,000, all right? Well, you have that $100,000 facility. You possess it. That's an asset that's worth $100,000. So the $100,000 is not a cost. It's the $5,000 interest on the loan that you're going to be paying. That is an explicit cost. Well, suppose instead of doing that, you have $40,000 of savings. Maybe it's invested in a mutual fund or something. You would not normally have that much in a savings account because it's not earning, you know, the interest income is negligible if you have that in a bank account. You would have that in a mutual fund of some sort. Uh, so you, let's say you do. Well, you could take that $40,000 out of your investments and use that and then only borrow $60,000. Would this save you in costs? That's the question. An economist would say, no, it's not going to save you anything because now you're borrowing $60,000, 5% of $60,000 is $3,000. So you're going to be paying $3,000 in interest income to the bank. That's an explicit cost. However, you're giving up the opportunity to invest that forty thousand dollars, or to keep it in, uh, to keep it in the market, earning a rate of return. Let's say the rate of return was also five percent, conservatively. Well, then you were earning two thousand dollars a year. You're giving up the opportunity to in, to uh, to earn two thousand dollars of investment income because you took that forty thousand dollars out of your investments to use in your business. So that's an implicit cost, foregone investment income of $2,000. And so the cost is the same to an economist because an economic cost equals explicit cost plus implicit costs. So here's another example with some more details. Vicky quits her job at Acme Dynamite Company. Does anybody know where that comes from? Acme Dynamite Company, there's a cartoon, a very old cartoon from my childhood. You guys probably don't even know about Looney Tunes. Uh, this would be Bugs Bunny, Wiley Coyote, uh, would buy his dynamite from Acme Dynamite Company. Anyway, she was working there, and she was being paid $22,000 a year. She leaves that job to start a t-shirt shop. She invests $20,000 of savings to start up this business. 
it's been earning $1,000 per year in investment income. Maybe it's in a mutual fund. Her new company occupies retail space that she owns, but she previously was renting this space for $5,000 per year to someone else. She decides to hire one clerk to help in the store who will earn $18,000 per year. So just of this information, think about what the costs are and what kinds of costs. All right, first she quit her job at Acme Dynamite Company, making $22,000 a year. That's an implicit cost, isn't it? An opportunity cost. Now that she's opened this t-shirt shop, foregone wages of $22,000. She's giving up the opportunity to make $22,000 working for someone else. That is an implicit cost. That's an opportunity cost. We have to include that. All right. She invests $20,000 of her savings or investments in the company. The $20,000 is not a cost. It's the $1,000 per year that is a cost. Foregone investment income. This $20,000 that she's had to use to, let's say, buy a startup inventory of materials, that was earning $1,000 per year. <laughs> Luna, please. We're busy here. All right? So, foregone investment income of $1,000. <laughs> she has retail space that she owns that she's using in this business, but she could be renting it, renting it to someone else for $5,000 per year. So that's foregone rental income. That's an implicit cost, an opportunity cost. We have to use that too. And then finally, the clerk salary, that's an explicit cost. That's an accounting cost. That would actually be uh, tracked by an accountant. And so here's a summary. All right, so you can see the costs are listed there. Uh, so in some additional detail, your total revenue is $120,000 a year. That's the total revenue of the business. But the cost of the t-shirts, $40,000, so that's materials. The clerk's salary, $18,000. And then utilities are costing you $5,000. So these are each explicit costs, accounting costs, right? So total explicit costs then are $63,000. If you subtract that from the total revenue, your accounting profit is $57,000. You feel pretty good about yourself, don't you? Well, I guess you feel pretty good about that. It is good to have an accounting profit, but you're ignoring those implicit costs. You provided your own financial capital. You had to take money out of investments, right? You were making money working for someone else. You have to think of that too. You're using your own space, which you could be renting to others. These are the implicit costs. Plus, there's one more. Normal profit. Remember I told you what normal profit is. That's the amount of money you would expect to be uh, receiving as compensation for applying your entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial skill to any business such as this. Or another way to think of it is, whatever the second best use of your entrepreneurial skill would be, whatever the second best type of business venture would be, you would earn uh, a profit doing that. That's what normal profit is. We're going to include that as a cost, an implicit cost, because that is an opportunity cost. You gave up the opportunity to start a different kind of a business where you would have been compensated X amount of dollars. That is the normal profit. That is a cost to an economist. Now let's figure out economic profit. It's going to be smaller than accounting profit, right? Well, accounting profit was $57,000, but now we need to subtract each of the implicit costs. Foregone investment income or interest income of $1,000. Foregone rent because you're using your own space, $5,000. Foregone wages, $22,000. That's what you made at the Acme Dynamite Company. And then foregone entrepreneurial income, and let's say that that's estimated to be to $5,000. Okay, so that's an additional $33,000 of implicit costs. So your economic profit now is just $24,000. Well, that's still good, right? That's a positive number. As long as it's a positive number, then you're doing better here in this business than whatever your next best business venture would have been.
So again, economic profit tells you how your current business venture compares to the next best alternative business venture you could have chosen. You're making $24,000 more than that. What if your economic profit's a negative number? That means you made the wrong decision. You should have chosen the next best alternative venture was much better. So you misjudged. You want for your economic profit to be a positive number or at least zero. If it's exactly zero, then it means that you're doing exactly as well as you could have done in the next best alternative venture. This is going to be the answer to a tricky question I'm going to ask you in the near future. So try to remember this concept. Put a star next to that last bullet. All right, time for a quiz. Think about, in each of these two scenarios, scenario A and scenario B, how your accounting profit and your economic profit is affected. All right? The equilibrium rent on office space, so in other words, the market value of office space or the market price of office space has just increased by $500 a month. That's actually something that's happening across our economy right now. As property values rise, uh, rents are going up. All right, so the market price for rent goes up by $500 a month. You're running a business. Suppose you uh, are renting your office space from others. So you have an accounting business, let's say. You're renting office space from someone else. You're paying someone a lease. You have a lease. You're paying someone uh, some amount per month. It doesn't even matter what it is, but it's going up by $500 a month, right? What happens to your accounting profit first? Well, your explicit costs are going up by $500 a month, right? Then your accounting profit's going to shrink by $500 a month, right? Total revenue hasn't changed, but your explicit costs are going up by $500 a month, right? What happens to your uh, economic profit? It's also going down by $500 a month because your explicit costs are going up by $500 a month. Remember, economic profit is total revenue minus explicit costs minus implicit costs. How about scenario B? What happens to the, each of these two types of profit if, in this case, you own your office space? So you own the space that you're using to run your accounting firm out of. And the market price for uh, rental space, office space, has just gone up by $500 a month. Well, think about what's happened to your costs. You own your own space. Anything change to your explicit costs? No, because you were not renting to begin with and you're not renting now, right? You're not paying someone else rent. So your explicit costs stay the same. How about implicit costs? Ah, it's your implicit costs that are going up by $500 a month, right? And remember, economic costs take into account both explicit and implicit costs. All right, so now let's go in order. What happens then to your accounting profit? No change to accounting profit because accounting profit is total revenue minus explicit costs. And nothing's happening to your explicit costs because you own your own space. You're not making payments to anyone else. So there's no change to accounting profit. How about economic profit? Well, there is a change to your economic profit because economic profit equals total revenue minus explicit costs, which stay the same, minus implicit costs, which go up by $500. So your economic profit goes down by $500. That's why economic profit is a better quantity to use in decision making. And here are the answers to those two questions written out in red for you to absorb. Now we're ready to start talking about pure competition or perfect competition. And we're going to do that in part B of chapter 8. And we're going to start here by talking about the spectrum of business firms, market structures, where what's varying left to right is level of competition. Less competition as you go to the right, 
and more competition as you go to the left. And I'll see you then in Chapter 8, Part B.